to our first town hall meeting. I'm Andy Caldwell. And um, as, as you all know, I'm running for Congress. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm running is because of my concern for our country. And we're gonna be uh, sh doing a couple things today. One of them is showing you a, a brand new video. It captures uh, my thoughts and sentiments about the riots and protests and the Black Lives Matter movement here in America. Um, and then after that, we're gonna show a PowerPoint presentation um, having to do with COVID-19. And one of the things that uh, we are seeking to convey to people is, is in military parlance, if snipers wanted to take somebody out, they use a, a strategy known as triangulation. And right now, America is being triangulated. Uh, by socialists, uh, anarchists, and globalists. And this is not a Democrat or Republican thing because in fact, there's people from both parties and, and all income streams um, involved in all of this. And the Black Lives Matter movement and some of the, the progressive movements in America have ended up being co-opted by these things. And so um, we want to show you this video. Uh, and the other thing I was going to tell you about the PowerPoint presentation is that um, it will eventually be a, a created or presented in a video format as well, so that you'll be able to go through the materials um, at your leisure. We're not going to go through every point on every slide. One of the most important things about my campaign is I've sought to make myself uh, available to people. All of our campaign was built on a meet and greet strategy, grassroots. We did anywhere from one to three events a day from 20 people in a house to 250 people in a barn. But this is our new normal right now where we're having to do things online, Facebook, YouTube, and all the other social media platforms. And so we're hoping to, to tell people that this is not just a uh, an event, but it is integral and essential that as many people um, as possible will tune in to what we're seeing and doing because this is our main way of being able to reach you. But also, um, when we do events, we always take questions, and today is no different. We're going to be taking questions on um, YouTube via chat and on Facebook via comments. Now, one thing I have to tell you, I have a little negotiating to do here because there is a little bit of a delay between my uh, speaking and or sharing with you and the time you see it and the time you get back for you know questions or comments in the chat or comment sections. And so, um, we're going to try not to break up the thing too much, the continuity and the flow of it, but this is a participatory town hall. And so we want um, you to be able to ask questions. Um, none of this is scripted per se. I mean, the, it, you know, except the, the slideshows are, but I'm not following a script. This is a, a stream of consciousness communication. So again, we want to thank everybody joining on YouTube and on Facebook Live. And we're gonna go ahead and show this five minute video about what's going on in America right now. Hello, this is Andy Caldwell. I'm here to talk to you about the fact that anarchists are hijacking the Black Lives Matter movement. All of America is grieving in righteous anger as a result of the death of George Floyd. Accordingly, I support bringing the cops who are involved to trial while avoiding trying them in the court of public opinion. Meanwhile, I hope that all Americans would support peaceful demonstrations against policemen misconduct while maintaining respect for all the good cops who risk their lives for us on a daily basis. Now, some pundits have speculated that had we listened to Colin Kaepernick, then maybe George Floyd's life could have been spared. I disagree. 
Or as Colin Kaepernick's bended knee was in itself a nonviolent form of protest, his protest did not and will not produce any more change than will looting and rioting. Why? These protests fail to focus on the core problems affecting inner cities, including a never-ending cycle of poverty, failed schools, violence, and abortion. That is, the poverty comes from broken families and failed public schools. 90% of the violence emanates not from abusive cops, but fellow residents. And finally, the authentic genocide facing blacks in America stems from astronomical abortion rates, meaning the black population in America has fallen below replacement rates of reproduction, a self-repudiation of the values of black lives. The solution? We need better role models, civic leaders, ministers and politicians, because the people in charge are failing miserably. We need role models that will demonstrate stable family constructs. We need to listen to the civic and religious leaders who support family, spiritual, economic, and cultural revitalization. With respect to politicians, the poorest of America keep electing representatives all cut from the same cloth, such as Maxine Waters and Nancy Pelosi, and nothing ever gets better. Now let us consider the existential threat presented by Antifa, an armed militia of mostly Caucasian anarchists in training. Antifa is exploiting Mr. Floyd's loss of life and the abysmal living conditions in inner cities, including economic stagnation. They have hijacked the tragedy of Mr. Floyd's death as they would a plane to crash it into the economic, social, religious, and political institutions of our land, a la 9-11. Truthfully, we are in the throes of a civil guerrilla war. Those anarchists and terrorists have no genuine empathy for George Floyd or any other black life. Their goal is to foment murder and mayhem, including killing cops, black cops included, business owners and innocent bystanders in order to further their cause. Why else would they vandalize the Lincoln Memorial? And who would vandalize the Lincoln Memorial in the cause of Black Lives Matter? Antifa's plan is to foment widespread and catastrophic destruction in order to demonstrate power and to inspire fear. Their plan is to exploit the anger, idleness, and hopelessness of some 40 million people in America who are now out of work, especially the people living in America's inner cities. President Trump was making headway in raising these communities up via policies that helped create millions of jobs and he initiated justice reform. But now disparate movements have taken advantage of the coronavirus shutdown along with the death of George Floyd to advance their specific goals and agendas. Namely, socialists who want government control of our lives and our economy, globalists who want the end of independent nation states in the name of a better world order, and anarchists, those who promote the end of civil society, law and order. As for their fellow travelers, including progressives and Black Lives Matters, well, they're simply useful pawns in this deconstruction project. The catastrophes emanating from California's unique and inordinately long virus shutdown and the riots, coupled with the one million jobs lost via AB5, the law which eliminated most contractor jobs in this state, means that California will be the last state in the union to recover. And as usual, the people in our inner cities will be the last of the last to recover if they ever manage to do so. That is, if America as a whole survives the war upon us. 
This is Andy Caldwell. I'm running for Congress. I paid for and authorized this message. Please visit my campaign website, andycaldwell2020.com. Thank you. Well, I'd love to know if anybody has any comments uh, they'd like to share on YouTube via chat or Facebook in the comments section. As you know, what, we're, what we really want to do right now, America's divided. We want America to be united. I still believe in the concept of the melting pot. I believe the, the emphasis on multiculturalism actually helped to divide America, stratify it, and I want to unite it. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for office. So, um, you know, we, we have successfully in the first part of the campaign, we did successfully reach across the aisle. We got almost 20,000 votes from independents and Democrats. We're hoping to build on that success. If there's no uh, comments or questions, I'm going to go ahead and start our uh, PowerPoint presentation having to do with COVID, all of this, everything we're talking about today, the riots, the protests and all this stuff, all of it is related. And, you know, one of the things that we were told during the COVID shutdown is we had to listen to the experts, but the question's always been, which experts were they listening to? And secondly, the issue of science versus, uh, which is based on actual data versus computer models, which are basically generating projections and predictions that turned out to be orders of magnitude off. One of the, one of the key points that I wanna make, make to you today is that as one commenter noted, the virus was not America's or the world's black swan event, the shutdown was. And one of the issues, one of the issues here is that they based the projection, the predictions and projections created policies. The policies ended up locking us down. But the truth of the matter is, is the models are wrong. The institutions have admitted they're wrong, but we're still left with the policies. I don't want to Tell, uh, think Slow Heath commented that he thought the video was awesome. It created tears. We nailed it. And folks, it's only as good as to the degree you share this. This video is going to go live after this uh, town hall is over. If you share it, it will help us get our message and more importantly, our heart out to CD24. And so um, we're going to go ahead and start the PowerPoint presentation right now. Uh, I'm old enough to have watched Keystone Cop movies in pizza parlors in Lompoc when I was growing up. And a Keystone Cop, the best definition out there, individual or group that appears extremely incompetent while exhibiting an uncommon amount of energy in the pursuit of failure. And we're gonna be sharing key Keystone Cop moments as we go through. So earlier I spoke about which um, experts are you listening to? We're going to talk about China here for a moment because we're going to end this slide uh, presentation in our message talking about China. And you have to understand why China is essential to what's going on right here. General Robert Spaulding is somebody I have had on the show more than one time. The second bullet point is the most important on the slide. He served as the chief science China strategist for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. He was our top ranking military expert on China. So what did he have to say? Well, I interviewed him about a column he wrote in American Military News. Again, top military expert on China. He references the release of the virus as the beginning of a global war. The release of the virus was the beginning of a global war. How so? Well, here's the deal. Most people, most experts, and I'll tell you why in a minute, believe this virus was created in China. We have no proof that it was released from the lab on purpose, but we do know without a doubt it was spread around the world on purpose. Why? 
Well, it has all, all has to do with the Chinese theory of war. It's called unrestricted warfare. Everything is an act of war. Them having Diane Feinstein's chauffeur as a spy or the Harvard professor that got arrested, his research assistant was a lieutenant in the Chinese army, another version of spying on us. Them stealing corporate secrets, them hacking into corporations and government databases. Everything is war. The general goal, they want to weaponize globalization. And remember, I told you that one of the triangulation strategies or snipers is globalization. And what they want to do there is eliminate nation states or eliminate the authority and the independence of nation states. So China weaponizes globalization, and then when they intentionally spread the virus, they ended up doing everything they could to deflect blame, cause panic, and take advantage of the situation. So why did they believe this Chinese research lab was the source of the leak? Because back in 2018, our State Department sent a couple of sensitive but unclassified cables warning that the lab's work on bat coronaviruses and their potential human transmission represented the risk of a new SARS-like pandemic, and that's exactly what happened. With regard to them deliberately leaking this thing, they shut down, China shut down all internal domestic flights to and from Wuhan while allowing all international flights to continue. They, they basically, set 5 million of their residents out of China. 1 million of them ended up in the United States. That was before the shutdown. President Trump deserves all the credit for shutting down that travel or it would have been worse. This is what happened in Italy as well. Italy has a huge business connection to the Wuhan. And then of course, China destroyed the evidence that would have helped us diagnose and evaluate the virus. They hit it with the complicity of who, which they control. And finally, this is a huge point, last bullet point. The China, when America and the rest of the world started complaining about China and how they deliberately spread this and hid all this information from us, they threatened to retaliate by plunging America into the mighty sea of the coronavirus. And so, the next slide is the next big expert that everybody needs to know about. John Ioannidis, professor at Stanford. He has four different titles there. He's an epidemiologist, a professor of medicine, professor of health research and policy, and biological med medical data science or metadata research. What does that mean? He is literally world famous, top 10 scientist in the world, top physician in the world in terms of research. And his forte is poking holes and or finding flaws in other people's research, selection bias and all these other things. He, that's what he does for a living and that's why he's world famous. So he took apart, he took apart um, this whole, uh, scenario, because again, it was based on computer models, not actual data. And he said the coronavirus was not a once in a century pandemic. It was a once in a century evidence fiasco. And that the media and the politicians and all the activists loved the fact that it was a perfect storm of urgent, spectacular, exciting, ap apocalyptic results. And they were off by orders of magnitude. Somebody has asked the question, how do we know that we did not, the United States didn't create the virus? Uh, we don't know that for sure because the United States helped develop or build that laboratory in Wuhan after our uh, government said they didn't want that research happening here. So we had a hand in it. In fact, some of the things that Fauci had uh, a patent on is part of that coronavirus. So we did have an indirect hand, but we certainly did not, I don't believe, purposely release it. So anyway, um, so then here's the deal. These are a couple of institutions you need to know about. Professor Neil Ferguson works at Imperial College. His model 
was the original computer model that generated all of the panic worldwide. He came up with the surge prediction. He later had to admit that he was his estimates were off by orders of magnitude. He has since been fired. And he predicted, for instance, in this current uh, episode that Sweden would experience 96,000 deaths. The real number was 4,000. Sweden's important here because Sweden didn't go into full lockdown mode. And people criticized him at first, but now even the World Health Organization is saying they had the right approach. Because instead of quarantining healthy people, they push for what's called herd immunity. The point here is, is that Sweden was not the one that was experimenting with this virus. It was the rest of the world. And of course, he was off previous times. Bird flu off again, orders of magnitude. Swine flu, the same thing. The other big institution that was involved with all of these predictions was at the University of Washington. They call it the IHME, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. They were off. They had to cut their California predictions by 75%. Again, these are keystone cop moments. We relied on these predictions. When the modelers said they were wrong, we didn't change our policy. Even Governor Cuomo said all the models were wrong. They were all wrong. All of them were wrong, but they didn't change the policies. Here's a couple of examples of how bad off they were. This was uh, CDC uh, actual numbers versus California's predicted or projected numbers vis-a-vis -vis Newsom. Again, 3,000 to 39,000 off by orders of magnitude. Then you have the predicted daily deaths. Again, we were supposed to hit this huge surge up to 3,000 people a day were supposed to be dying by the middle of May. And in fact, the numbers had already begun to, gun to crater. So what happened in New York? New York and New Jersey had one third of all American cases. What happened there? One of our regular guests on the uh, radio shows, Frank Bernuccio from the New York Analysis of Policy and Government, they didn't shut down their society. In fact, they told people we're well prepared, the threat is low, no reason not to take the subway, no reason to quarantine if you just came from Wuhan. That's what they were telling their people. So what, what I believe that one of the top ways they did end up spreading it, and they've now confirmed this, is the subways. This is a picture of the subway in New York uh, during the coronavirus shutdown. See some of the people wearing masks, many of them not, crammed in there like sardines. Now here's another huge um, keystone cop moment. Cuomo got a lot of negative press nationally because he did he mixed the people that were that had COVID in with nursing homes and or people in nursing homes that got it, they weren't isolated. But Governor Newsom did the same exact thing. Santa Barbara County, this statistic's over a month old because they don't always produce these statistics. Just in our county, we had 152 cases at congregate care settings. This is a match on gasoline. Thousands of people in the United States Thousands died because they were in nursing homes. The staff was not isolated. They weren't tested. They're still barely testing these people. And yet they forced them into the nursing homes. Here's the LA Times. Last bullet point on this, confirming this. There was another story on April 1st, an order by the California Department of Health prepare to care for them if they're infected. That's a keystone cop moment. Here's, here's part of what's going on economically. John Kapal, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. One in four California residents are gonna lose their jobs. One in four businesses will or could close permanently and, and if they don't open things up right away. Um, we're spending a million dollars a minute, the Federal Reserve. Uh, we're already up to about a trillion dollars in losses. And around the world, one people, one billion people are going to be in the throes of an economic death spiral. And here's a keystone cop moment. One million healthcare workers have been laid off in the name of protecting public health and safety. 
And, you know, again, the predictions were up to over 20 million people in America could, could end up being infected. Uh, this has caused all sorts of other problems with people not having basic food supplies, not being able, they either don't get into their doctor or they're too scared to go to their doctor. One of the things I've said is they literally scared us to death of the coronavirus. So people that are having heart problems don't go in. People that think they may have had a stroke don't go in because they think catching the coronavirus is worse. There's also, we're losing funding for not just law enforcement, but schools and healthcare. And this is a big issue that we're gonna talk about here and in the next slide. It's been known and proven for decades that every percent of unemployment going up causes people to lose their lives, depression, suicide, alcohol, drug abuse, and domestic violence. And we've had a couple of guests on the show, um, including Dr. Robert Klein and Dr. Marilyn Singleton are both doctors and lawyers. In one of the Keystone Cop moments, we prevented ourselves from reaching herd immunity by isolating the well people and the asymptomatic people. There's emerging science of the asymptomatic people nearly impossible for them to spread the disease. So we kept ourselves from getting herd immunity. And then all these other diseases are spiking, diabetes, stroke, heart uh, ailments, and all the like. You know, appointments for things like colonoscopy or melanoma and things like that all got canceled for a couple of months. And some of those things, you can die if you're not gonna be seen within a couple of months. So we have another question, how do we organize to stand up to this, all these attacks? Well, the first thing is getting this information in the hands of people. And secondly, trying to convey this information to our decision makers, including the people that are losing their business and their livelihood. And that's why we're doing this right now. This is what we need to be doing. So here's another corona, uh, Keystone Cop coronavirus shutdown metric. You can see my um, pointer here, the least likely group out of all the age group to get coronavirus are school age children, K through 12. We did not need to shut down our schools. Now there was a problem that the teachers, some of the teachers may have been uh, prone to or susceptible. So we would have needed to take precautions with them. But as far as the schools go, we did not need to shut down the schools. And in fact, shutting down the schools may have ended up spreading this and locking down the economy because the majority of these cases are now coming out of people at home. They share everything, they touch everything, they're in a relatively confined space and they don't wipe anything down and they're not wearing masks. May have been the worst thing we did um, in all of this. What we should have done and what we should do now we should have isolated the vulnerable, the age and those with compromised immunity. Let me uh, say something very clearly. I'm 62, I have asthma. I've got a target on my back from coronavirus. I do not downplay the dangers of this virus because if I got it, I'd probably be dead. So I've actually been careful, but I've not been paranoid and I've not been hysterical. We got to focus by isolating, protecting these people. We did the exact opposite. We should have shut down mass transit. We did the exact opposite. We should have done <clears throat> increased safety protocols in the vulnerable populations. We didn't do it. Over half the cases, well over half the cases in Santa Barbara County came out of the Lompoc prison. And then finally, we should have pushed for herd immunity. Gavin Newsom says we're not getting to stage four unless we have a therapeutic or a vaccine. We may never get those things. That's why Sweden went for herd immunity. Folks, we didn't just flatten the curve, we cratered the curve. This is Santa Barbara's worst. Uh, we passed it over a month and a half ago where the number of recoveries completely and totally eclipsed the number of people getting it. And secondly, the number of recoveries is now approaching the total number of people who did get it. Um, and again, this is uh, the federal prison numbers are all jacked up. This number, I'm gonna go back a slide. I need to tell you something really important here. All of these charts, if you can see my mouse, all of these charts start on March 15th. 
the virus has been here since at least January. Some doctors, local doctors, will say it's been here since December. They didn't chart it. It's if nobody got sick, nobody got hospitalized, nobody died until they declared the shutdown. The other thing, these other cases, there was never any surge. The top line, this is cumulative cases, but the, these are the numbers down here as far as people getting hospitalized. The black line, the flat is not the axis. That's the number of people that died. It's always been flatlined. And the same thing here too, all of these other cities have all had a steady number of cases <coughs> over the last month and a half because again, it never did surge like they said it was gonna surge. These are grant, another way to present the, this data. Um, and, you know, the worst advice, again, they gave us was to stay home. Um, data analyst Brian Gable, from, uh, who writes for Newshawk in Santa Barbara, he's a data analyst. He, the math he did showed that the curve was flat before Newsom ordered the shutdown. 90% of our cases are coming out of the prison and or uh, nursing homes. So uh, Jennifer on Facebook has asked about, about, I've been told multiple times by various people in my school district that 50% of the teachers in her district are immune compromised and, and the teachers union pulled the plug. Well, I, I just did mention a few minutes ago, and I know there's a lag here that yes, we would have had to protect the teachers and worry about the teachers. But here's the deal, folks. If masks, social distancing, and plexiglass works, then it works. You know, again, um, ultimately folks, we're gonna get to this point. If you want different results, you're gonna have to get different leaders. Because I've shared most all of the information. I did over 150 radio interviews plus independent research on this whole shutdown, the virus, transmission rates, fatality rates. I shared it with all of our local leaders and they pretty much blew us off. So, you know, we, we need you to help us get out this information. The video we showed at the beginning is going to uh, be on Facebook and YouTube. This presentation is gonna be on Facebook and YouTube. Share it, understand it, invite me to present this information to uh, people in your organization. So the worst advice they gave us was to stay home. Uh, you know, and again, 90% of the cases, prisons and nursing homes, even the New York City had to admit upwards of 70% of the new infections were at home. Now, but now to make uh, things worse, I'm gonna break that for a second. To make things worse, folks, there's three things they wanna do, test, trace, and isolate. We know with the testing, I, I joke, it's Vinnie, Vinnie Barbarino's up your nose with the rubber hose. That's the test part. Trace part is they want to test or trace everybody you've been in contact with if you, if you test positive, even if you're asymptomatic. And that to some degree makes sense, except when you get to the dirty details of isolate, test, trace, isolate. Because they're spreading in the home, now they said, we've got to isolate you <coughs> from your home. Ventura County Public Health Director put this on video. We're gonna take you out of your home. Then there's the issue of, and or let's say you're a single parent and you got kids, they take your kids into foster care. So uh, remember we can do any, <coughs> excuse me, we can do any of <coughs> this presentation to any group, especially after the lockdown or even right now by Zoom. So, um, again, this information, um, there's a guy that took all the stuff that I learned um, and independently of me, <coughs> and he uh, put all of this in a 55-page paper. It's easy to read. It's got great, great references. Uh, Bobby McGinnis um, is on YouTube has asked, how much power do local officials have to move against Newsom? 
Well, a lot of them are compromised because they don't want to get the governor mad because they want money from the governor. However, Jan Dow, for instance, a DA in San Luis Obispo, said he's not enforcing the church order. There were cops in Southern California said, we're not enforcing the beach order. If the cops don't enforce it and the DA doesn't prosecute, that's one of the ways they can buck the system. The other one is for these local officials to push back, which very few of them have been willing to do. San Luis did a much better job than did Santa Barbara County um, on that. So um, let's go to the next slide. Where do we go from here? Well, this is why we talked about China. We've got to create a long-term plan to sever our dependence and vulnerability to China. We have to rebuild our economy. And in fact, in fact, number one helps us do number two. These two are completely and totally interrelated. You create a long-term plan, rebuild our economy. Three, how do we keep from another black swan event? How do we keep these protests peaceful? We need to elect new leaders who will focus on the facts, not ideolo ideology, rhetoric, and everything else. You know, the bottom line is <coughs> counties <coughs> throughout the uh, United States and states like Georgia, Florida, and Texas are opening up. Again, you want better results, you get better leaders. The bottom line is the coronavirus and the shutdown are crises. They are legitimate crises, but they're not the only crises. And there's a heck of a lot of other things that we still need to be focusing on. And, and with respect to bringing back those industries, phar pharma pharmacy or medicines, raw materials, manufacturing, heavy industry. And again, these things were driven to China by our own policies, rules, regulations, taxes, and things like that. Those things are gonna to have to be changed if we're gonna bring back these jobs. Um, you know, the uh, other issue is we need to rebuild our economy without, there's thousands of rules and regulations, again, that um, have disrupted our economy. Andrea from YouTube wants to know, well, how does Salute Carbohol fit into this? Let me say this, as plainly as I can be, Salute Carbohol is part of the problem, not the solution. I've known this guy for over 20 years. He has never, ever re re supported uh, regulate, regulatory streamlining, ever. He doesn't support lower taxes. Um, and he's never, as far as I know, ever criticized China. He's not talking about any of the things that we've been talking about here. He's one of the guys that said, listen to the experts. That's about all they had to say on the coronavirus shutdown. Listen to the experts and or basically spend us into oblivion by borrowing and or printing $3 trillion of money that the federal government didn't have. They wanna spend another 3 trillion. He has a 100% voting record along with Nancy Pelosi, 100%. Their agenda is not America first. That's why they're fighting Donald Trump's agenda. They are part of the globalist, socialist, two parts of that three-part triangle. And uh, I won't say they're anarchists, but, but again, the policies now that Democrats are driving of shutting down or cutting funding for cops, there'll be a trifecta there, globalism, socialism, and anarchism. So Salute Carbohol is lock, stop, in step with all of these things, all of these coronavirus key points, he's in lock, step with all of them. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, we've got to do, of course, is, is get back to these industries, back to America. We've got to review these regulations. There was a number of regulations, of course, that they said that, well, they suspended. And, and I'll give you one, like for instance, Santa Barbara County has been fighting wineries from serving food for decades. Now, all of a sudden on a Friday, they issue an order, it's okay to serve food. Why? Because the industry was shut down unless they serve food. These are just a, a, a little example of that. Um, you know, the, the, the issue is we've got 
politicians like Salute Carbajal, Nancy Pelosi, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Again, Salute Carbajal votes with the squad 95% of the time, with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. They are ideologues. They, they don't understand how the economy works. They think they can shut down businesses and spend money, shut down people's income streams and, and, and continue on as if they still got money to spend. The bottom line is we're the source of that money. You and I are the source of the money they're spending and or borrowing against. You know, the bottom line is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is an avowed socialist. And Salute Carbajal votes with her upwards of 96, 97% of the time. He doesn't represent the Central Coast. In fact, one of the guys on my Facebook page, when I mentioned his voting record with Pelosi, says Pelosi has a satellite office of her office here because he just does what she, he just does what she tells him to do. And now it's even worse. Now they're going to proxy votes where he doesn't even have to go to Washington. They'll cast his vote for him. That means the Central Coast is without representation. You know, uh, the other issues, we still have a cri housing crisis. We still suffer from fire danger, hot homeless crises. You know, they stuck the homeless into a motel in Santa Barbara. They had to hire security guards to protect the hotel from their new residents. And we're, and, and we're spending upwards of a million dollars on extra security these days. Our solutions, again, folks for the last 30 years have served as a government watchdog. And so I know this subject better than anything because I've written, I've written the equivalent of 15 200 page books based on the needs of our economy, taxpayers, the issue of rules and regulations in the state of California, the need for affordable housing, um, the issues of wildfires and the like. And we, I know this stuff, and I would love to debate Salute Carbajal on all of this, but of course he canceled the one debate that we had scheduled. So what have we learned? Newsom's moved the goalpost on a routine basis. Folks, when he, um, when he first announced this, he said we had to flatten the curve, we had to create surge capacity in our hospitals, and we had to make sure we had the right equipment for our hospital care providers, including personal protective equipment, <clears throat> ventilators and the like. I supported all that. We didn't know exactly what was coming our way from China because they buried the data, the statistics, the research and everything else, they buried it. So we did not know what was coming our way. So I supported an initial shutdown, but then he moved the goalposts because we were supposed to flatten the curve. Then he moved it to, we've got ther need therapeutics and we need a vaccine. That may never happen. We don't have a vaccine for AIDS. AIDS is a virus that's killed over 30 million people in the world. You know how many tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars we've sought spent trying to seek a cure for AIDS. SARS and MERS, Ebola, we don't have um, we don't have vaccines for any of these things. He moved the goalposts. He's making this stuff up as he goes. And the bottom line, if masks, as I mentioned before, if masks and social distancing work, we never needed to shut down our economy. So um, we've got another question. This is gonna, gonna take me a, a little bit to read this one. <laughs> uh, Michelle on Facebook, I attended a conference call with Salute Carbajal. He gleefully discussed all the money that was being approved to bail us out of this crisis. When I asked him why he doesn't just open up the county, he said one of the biggest reasons is that the hospitals are lacking PPE. Um, and they said they didn't have enough. Well, the bottom line is that's not true anymore. They have more than enough capacity. And again, these people just come out. If somebody said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And one of the things we learned is, first of all, the less the experts know, the worse their predictions. We should never trust 
quote unquote experts in a vacuum of real data. We need to never check our common sense at the door. Um, we don't want to rely on computer models. They've proven worthless, garbage in, garbage out. There's another thing called single function objective bias. Dr. Fauci's only concern was quote unquote saving lives via the shutdown. He didn't care about what happened to our economy. He didn't care about the deaths and or other things that could happen as a result. Later on, he finally admitted that, hey, we can't keep this shutdown going on forever, but that was too little too late. The other thing is people were in a state of mass induced hysteria. Again, the media and the politicians scared people to death. Fight and flight syndrome kicked in. I started writing columns. I've written a dozen columns on this. And as I mentioned, I've done over 150 radio interviews. I kept telling people, look, the virus is real, just like a fire in a theater is real. But the panic could cost us more lives than the fire. Let's calmly put the fire out and let's calmly get the people out of the theater. Um, Terry from Facebook asks, what can we do to help get Salud Carball to agree to a debate? Well, go on his Facebook page, go on his other his other accounts and ask other people to do so. Contact the local media, contact KSBY, contact Dave Congleton, contact uh, the New Times, the Santa Maria Sun, the Santa Barbara Independent, the Montecito Journal, KEYT, KCOY, KFFX. Contact them all and say, look, we're in the middle of a crisis we believe that this, to, this is a perfect time to compare and contrast facts, ideas, and ideologies and values. If not now, when? If not with Salud and me, then who? We're going to post a guide on what you can do on our website. And um, Barry, Barry from YouTube is asking, what difference will your election to Congress make? Folks, I've been a government watchdog that's been working for organized labor, agriculture, and business for over 30 years now. I know how the economy works across all spectrums. I'm not anti-union. I'm not anti-environment. I'm not certainly not anti-law enforcement. I've had the deputy sheriffs on my board for almost 30 years. I've been endorsed by all three deputy sheriff associations, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo County. And that was months ago, because they know I've got a solid record of supporting law enforcement. And, and what they're wanting to do is bring anarchy, chaos, and lawlessness to America by shutting down and defunding and deconstructing our civil justice system. So right now, what's going on right now? Right now, they want to declare racism as a public health emergency. Why? Why not just declare it a, a core concern? Because in their resolutions, if you read the resolutions, they don't want when they don't want cops arresting, for instance, black people in terms of Black Lives Matters demands for crimes. They want to refer them to counseling. That's in their resolutions. You can go to Galita right now, it's in their resolution. Um, now, the other question is, and this is the biggest issue. Folks, right now, I'm a guy with a newspaper column, a radio show, and somebody that speaks at government meetings and does public speaking. I don't have a bully pulpit. You get me elected to Congress, I'll have a bully pulpit in Congress, but more importantly, I'll have one back here at home. Right now, I've been sharing most of this with the media for months. They will not cover this aspect of the virus or the shutdown. They won't do it. Maybe I'll get one line in a, a news story because I spoke, but usually not even that. So Luke Carbajal gets publicity each and every time he uses it. It's called earned media, even though I don't believe he earned or did anything to earn it. He gets it. It comes with the office. I would have been challenging our local government. And just like Kevin McCarthy, I would have been challenging Governor Newsom. And, and I would have been another voice. And secondly, I would have been one less vote, vote for Nancy Pelosi's agenda. Again, 
Would you elect Nancy Pelosi to represent the Central Coast? Does she share our values? No. How does she help? How does anything she's doing helping people that are living paycheck to paycheck? She represents one of the richest districts in all of America. Smooth Carball should not be voting with her lock, stock, and barrel. Um, let's see here. Another quite a voter from YouTube is asking if I will support financial bailouts for states and cities with poorly managed budgets. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, the bottom line here is California has a before the coronavirus, and again, this is something I make a living doing and analyzing and speaking about. California had a one trillion dollar deficit before the coronavirus hit. They're going to want to try to blame all this stuff on the coronavirus. It's not due to the coronavirus. It's due to misplaced priorities. One of the other things, I'll give you an example of one of the other things. One of the things we mentioned in the video at the beginning of the broadcast that failed schools in inner cities. County Supervisor Doss Williams, when he was in the assembly, was the chair of the assembly education committee. They wouldn't give those poor kids in those inner cities school vouchers or school choice because they're beholden to the teachers union, not the kids. Uh, EV from, and, and you know, one other thing is I, I am a huge fan of the constitution. I have a lawyers, including constitutional law professors on my show on a regular basis. I am steeped in understanding the principles of our constitution and I'm completely dedicated and devoted to protecting the same. It's one of the reasons I'm running for office. So Eve from Facebook asks, what did I think about the Supreme Court ruling on church gatherings? Um, I believe it was unconstitutional. I believe Justice Roberts completely blew it. And, and I can go into this. I did a whole show on this last week. I actually debated an attorney on this because I believe that that ruling sucked in terms of our constitution. Now, one of the ways you can help is people keep asking, how can you help us? You can join our campaign. You can volunteer to make phone calls. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. You can share it. Folks, if you don't share what I'm posting, you're the only one that's seen it in your network of friends. You've got to share. Uh, again, get me speaking engagement, Zoom or in person. Come to our events once this lockup ends. Come to our events. And, um, you know, the bottom line is in our elections as well. Um, we have a problem. California's been doing absentee ballots for a long time, vote by mail. I don't know how big of a problem that is if the voter files are purged regularly. Like, for instance, this coming season, if Cal Poly and UCSB don't come back in session, there should be 20,000 plus voters purged from our voting files to eliminate or reduce the potential for fraud. But the fraud is on steroids vis-a-vis -vis ballot harvesting. That is where the greatest abuse lies because the people that are turning in these ballots can do so fraudulently. We don't know who they collected them from or how they collected them and things like that. Um, another uh, voter on Facebook has asked, reopening schools is scheduled for this, office, uh, this August. I know a dozen families with children in public schools will be homeschooling with kids in masks all day. They're unable to um, leave desks until going to the school restroom, no peas, no recess. That right there is overkill. Again, is the fact that we shared the uh, screen earlier that kids K through 12 are the least likely, one tenth of 1% will need to be hospitalized. Most of them are gonna be, almost all of them will be asymptomatic. Folks, here's the deal. Children need to socialize. They need to be together. They get depressed and suicidal and or go to drug, alcohol abuse and or get involved in mischief and crime because of the frustration and the isolation and the pressure it puts on them. This is proven, I've, in fact, I've done a couple of shows on this just in the last week. 
including just yesterday with an addiction expert who himself is a recovering alcoholic and has started a foundation for addiction. And the bottom line, isolating kids is one of the absolute worst things you could do. And it's also extremely bad for veterans. Um, I had a local guy who is a veteran, a counselor and, and nonprofit guy, and he uh, dealing and helping veterans with PTSD said the worst thing you could do to a veteran suffering from PTSD is isolate them. They need to be with other people. They keep their spirits up and, and help them, support them, encourage them, and, and literally lift them up. And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that is another Keystone Cop moment. And so I want to go back to this. Um, again, we don't need... Nancy Pelosi and Salud Carbajal relying on junk computer models to destroy the US economy and then borrow trillions of dollars to destroy it further. And yet that's exactly what they are doing. And we've got to stop this while we still can. And um, folks, we, we should never have to sacrifice our freedom out of fear. The constitution did not have a pandemic exemption. And finally, the socialist agenda. Gavin Newsom has um, issued 40 executive orders and changed 200 laws, many of which have nothing to do with the coronavirus outbreak. So, you know, for instance, decarceration, they were asking to do that before. They didn't want a crisis to go to waste. And so what they did is they decarcerated, they let thousands of people out of prison and jail, and many of them left jail and went and committed crimes immediately, including rape and murder. So um, that's the end of our presentation. I'm ready for any more questions on Facebook uh, and or YouTube. You, again, on YouTube, you can ask through the chat button on Facebook through the comment section. Um, you know, the bottom line, Salud Carbajal does not represent the Central Coast. He never has. Um, he's represented a, a party of far left progressive ideologues. And I've, I've actually told him this because I've known him for over 20 years. I've actually told him he forgot where you came from. I didn't forget where I came from. My dad was a veteran, a prisoner of war, World War II. My mom was an immigrant. My dad died uh, from associated traumas of the war. Um, I grew up poor, single parent family household. I've not forgotten where I came from. He forgot where he came from. I want to lead by serving based on facts, truth, and the Constitution and the needs of the Central Coast, not the whims, desires, or agenda of Nancy Pelosi and AOC, who salutes following like a puppy dog. Um, another voter on Facebook asked, how can we make sure our votes count? Um, we're going to have a track your ballot tool on our website. I'll, I'll just tell you this. Two of my girls, two of my girls were roommates at college. One of them got their vote by mail ballot. The other one didn't. One of my other daughters lives at home, goes to the polling place. They tell her, oh, you signed up for vote by mail. She said, no, I didn't. So two people, two out of my uh, seven kids had a problem in this last election. After you vote, there's a way you can find out if they got your vote. And we're going to have a track your ballot tool on our website. Again, folks, if you share what's going on and multiply what you heard here today and, and encourage people, this video, this PowerPoint presentation is going to be made into a video. And secondly, the other video is already in a video and it's gonna be released here, uh, maybe even today. We need you to share the heck out of it. Support me, we need financial support for this campaign. Uh, we were raised a lot of money through meet and greets. Money's still coming in, but please remember to donate, ask other people to donate. The more money we receive, the more we can do, uh, the more exposure we can have, and again, because the media is not covering us on a routine basis, we've got to buy our exposure on the media.
and, and whether it's new media or television commercials or what have you, we've got to raise the money for that. So if there's, if there's not any more uh, chat uh, questions on YouTube or Facebook comments, um, we're going to close this out. We hit an hour. We told you uh, it take about an hour, which it did. Um, and I'm willing to hang out here. Um, oh, there is one more question. Um, Elsa from YouTube asked, how do we open our churches? Well, again, part of that is a function of your pastor. Um, some of the pastors are literally scared to spiritual death on this. They, they've resigned themselves to doing Facebook or, or YouTube or what have you, um, live stream. You know, I took heart from Dan Dow, the DA in San Luis Obispo. He looked at what Governor Newsom was saying, and he looked at what Attorney Barr, General Barr was saying, and said, I'm erring on the side of the Constitution. I'm erring on the side of religious freedom. And folks, our founding fathers, if you go back to the Declaration of Independence, what I, which I've always considered a preamble to the uh, Constitution, Thomas Jefferson said, it's not just our right to resist authoritarian power grabs, it's our duty. And I think you should social distance <clears throat> and wear a mask if you've got compromised immune systems. But by golly, if 3,000 people can march in San Luis Obispo or Santa Barbara, shoulder to shoulder, why can't people pray and worship and listen to a message shoulder to shoulder? Why isn't somebody like Salute Carbajal answering that question or any other politicians? I did not organize any of the rallies, but I spoke at most of them. I spoke in Paso to 700 people, Santa Barbara, um, San Luis Obispo, Santa Maria, in Lompoc, and Arroyo Grande for maybe five minutes. Everybody there social distanced the entire time, except for the five minutes when I was talking, they came a little bit closer. I got condemned for that by politicians. Some of the same politicians that are now showing up at these protest rallies and speaking themselves. Pure hypocrisy and double standards. Opening back up our economy was not their priority. It wasn't an emergency because they were still getting their paychecks. These other things, it's an emergency that they blew off <laughs> all of the requirements. Of, that they've been mandating themselves and promulgating themselves. Folks, you want to, again, you want better representation, elect different leaders. We are encouraging you to send AC to DC to stop AOC and her buddy, Salute Carbajal, and Salute Carbajal's mentor, leader, and guide, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you all for being with us. We really appreciate it. Please give us feedback and share what you've learned. And thank you for being with us. And um, we look forward to seeing a lot more of you in this next couple of months.